Yes, and welcome back to uh, Kevin Pollack's chat show. This is the, uh, the day that all tremendous Jews will atone for their sins, so I, I thought I'd start things off properly <laughs> by, by sinning. I was... <clears throat> that was probably wrong. I, I wish I was Jewish. Um, welcome back to the chat show. Uh, I'm very excited about today's show because I made it here seven minutes ago. I want to thank the people at Delta Airlines who um, just did a remarkable job today traveling from Atlanta, their hub, by the way, their hub in the United States, and Delta Airlines can't seem to get their shit together. You know, you book a flight, you book a return, you know you got a show to do, so you figure, hey, I need to be back by 1.30. Maybe we widen that shot. Look, see, paid a lot for that hat. Maybe it should be on camera. Um, I pay a lot to be back on time, too, you know? 1.27 p.m., that's the arrival time, that's what it says. Yeah, there's delays. I've seen delays. I've sat on the tarmac for six hours. Don't talk to me about delays. But today's delay, horseshit. So, love you, Delta, very, very much. Um, this is our 25th week, I've been told. We have cupcakes. Get one. They're delish. Uh, also, Joe's of Bleecker Street Pizza. It's just fantastic pie. Oh, love it here in Santa Monica. I'm not saying they should send a few pies by. I'm just saying it's really good pizza. Um, but 25 weeks, it, the number seemed important to uh, one of our producers, so we got cupcakes. And then I sort of realized after spending $4,700 on cupcakes, mm -hmm. you know what? I think 26 week is the, is the, is the mark because that would be half a year with the 52 weeks per year. So we celebrate 25 weeks because it's a nice sounding number. I think it sounds better if it's 25 years, but 25 weeks, one of our producers was wildly impressed. And I'm going to force him to eat all the cupcakes, <laughs> which he's quite pleased about. Uh, I want to thank the folks at Ustream uh, as always, and TriCaster. And you know, we have this, uh, this t-shirt company that's, uh, that's a friend of the show now, Donkey Tees. Don't kid yourself. If you mention chat show, or I think it's maybe just chat, check previous episodes, I'm old. I think you just remember the code, the promotional code word is chat. You get 20% 20, 20 off your entire order. They have uh, Kevin Pollock's chat show t-shirts now. That's a brand new item to you and yours. We're going to start giving them to each one of our guests, but not today. How you doing? All right. Um, Atlanta is where I mentioned where I was, uh, uh, um, telling some jokes for the fine folk there, and uh, also congratulating them for surviving the flood. You know, you look at the photographs online or on the news earlier in the week, and you just think the entire uh, city is underwater, and um, they're 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 fine. On the news, it looked like everybody's in scuba gear, coming out of the office buildings with snorkels. Uh, turns out they're okay. They're also, I don't know, until today, I'm not sure how they did earlier. I think they played the early game, but they were 2-0. I was helping them celebrate that they had won the first two games. Sands Dog Killer. So I was congratulating the fine folks of the Atlanta Falcons for, uh, for their two big victories without the dog killer. And to you folks in Philly, just remember the whole country's rooting for you. Um, we uh, ha had to check out the Six Flags. You know, they got the Six Flags there in the, uh, the Atlanta area, the outer area of Atlanta. And um, I just went so I could find that old guy, the old guy that dances, Mr. Flag. Mr. Six Flags or is it Mr. Flag? Anybody? Mr. Flag? Mr. Six? Mr. Six. Mr. Six. Oh, Mr. Six? Mr. Six. Oh, his name is as lame as it could possibly be. Thanks, Gelman. Uh, Mr. Six, I found that old fuck and I, I leveled him, I'll be honest with you. I put him out. Lights out for Mr. Six. He wasn't doing this move anymore. He was just flat. Uh, but I saw a very disturbing sight. There's a ride there, some log flume ride, let's call it that, that goes so high 
you could actually see into the so-called backstage area, you know, where the, well, well I, where I saw Batman, fully costumed, I'm assuming it was the Batman, on the back of a golf cart, being driven somewhere. You have no idea how disturbing of a visual that is. You have no idea. The Cape Crusader on a golf cart. Really? You don't want to give him a Batmobile? Even that fat, tired motorcycle? Something. I don't want to see Batman on the back of a golf cart, fuckers. It looked ridiculous. And he looked really upset, too. He looked kind of depressed. <laughs> Wonder Woman was there patting him on the shoulder. And you guys, I swear I could hear him say, These kids are killing me, Gloria. <laughs> Still give him that voice. Um, and smoking a butt. On the back of a golf cart, smoking a butt, the Cape Crusader. It was just, it was just ruined it for me. Um, These kids are killing me, Gloria. And I believe she said, shake it off, Stephen. Uh, my guest coming up in October, very excited. Uh, next Sunday, the first Sunday in October, Lisa Loeb, recording artist Lisa Loeb. So delightful. I'm sure she's atoning for sins today. Followed by uh, award-winning musical film composer Brian Tyler. And then a very funny man, funny pants, we might call him, Paul F. Tompkins. You heard me. And then the last Sunday of October, Weird Al Yankovic. Say it with me. I wonder if he just goes by Al Yankovic now. We'll find out. You'll have to tune in. Um, so very excited for, for some good shows coming up in October. Uh, also, I should mention, I'm going to be performing live stand-up in town at Largo at the Coronet. It's the first time I've actually performed in Los Angeles in over 10 years. I mean, I've done a f couple of sets at the UCB, which I love, kind of unannounced kind of thing. But this is the first thing where there's a name. It's Kevin Pollack and Friends, and um, I'm, I'm really excited. The Largo at the Coronet. If you've not been, Tuesday, October 6th would be a hell of a time to go. Um, I'm going to invite my first guest, actually, to come on the show, but I think I heard tell that he does his own show on, on, the, on the Tuesday nights. Did, did the researchers get that wrong? They did? Yeah. No, they got it right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, just for the people who've already seen Kevin Nealon perform on Tuesday nights, th just those people, you should go to the Largo. And those who have not seen him should skip the Largo and go to uh, wherever he tells you to as soon as he gets here in a couple of minutes. And by gets here, I mean sits comfortably until we put him on camera. As a way of introducing him, sure, I could tell you that he was born in St. Louis, Missouri. Congratulations on the Cardinals, by the way. Very, very fucking exciting. I don't know if you still root for him. I certainly do. And I'm from San Francisco. Um, I could tell you uh, some history about my guest, but instead what I'd like to do uh, is read an article that he wrote for the New York Times, uh, which I was so proud when I got wind of this, and by wind I think you know what I'm saying. You may have heard tell about this Anthony Pelicano character, doing a little bit of bugging, and by bugging, mm-hmm. Uh, turns out, our friend Kevin Nealon was on the list. He wrote in this New York Times op-ed piece titled, Don't Stop Bugging Me. Oh my God, I'm on Pelicano's list. Anthony Pelicano, the Hollywood private investigator who has been indicted on racketeering and conspiracy charges, apparently thought I might have some useful information. The illegal wiretapping, the searching of police databases. Was I surprised? Did I feel violated? Did I feel resentment? The answer is no to all three. I mean, why shouldn't I have my phone tapped? I'm a big player in this town and hold a lot of power. Anyone who's seen my cameo and Joe Dirt will attest to that. Holding for laugh. I have also learned that there is the possibility that the police database was searched to dredge up embarrassing material to be used against me if I ever decided to testify against an enemy. Is this something that surprises me? The answer again is no. Since I am clearly a somebody in this town, did I mention my cameo in The Wedding Singer? This comes with the territory. Although I have to say I wasn't aware that I had an enemy. Okay, never my wildest imagine. 
imaginings did I actually ever think Kevin Nealon and Wiretap would appear in the same news article. It's like seeing Dick Cheney's name on an invitation to a PETA gala. But I am elated to have made this group. It makes me feel important. You're nobody in Hollywood until you get on a list. I missed out on the Heidi Fleiss client list, Mr. Blackwell's worst dress list, and even the where are they now list. And the only reason I'm not on that last one is that Mr. Pelicano apparently always knew where I was. In hindsight, I should have known someone was eavesdropping on me. There were obvious signs. The peephole in my front door had been reversed. That's one of my favorites. I was sold a paper shredder that made copies. Homeless people went through my garbage before I even threw it out. I was issued license plates with my PIN number on them. Most upsetting to me, though, was discovering that my diary was missing. It is the diary I've kept since I was seven years old. And before you hear it from someone else, yes, I did have a major crush on Mary Barker in third grade. By the way, my wife finds it very exciting to be with a man who's been wiretapped. The intrigue, the mystery, and the secrecy are all very alluring. All of a sudden, I'm a bad boy. And believe me, I am milking it for everything it's worth. Occasionally, when we're strolling at night, I quickly pull her aside and look back, concerned, frightened. Frightened, she will ask, what's wrong? I reassure her and say, probably nothing. I just thought, no, nothing. <laughs> that was a good line reading, right? That's good. Okay. <laughs> what am I doing to protect my future privacy and to ensure my security? Not only have I changed all the locks in my house, but I have also moved the doors. <laughs> As an added measure of sec security, the doors will now swing out instead of in. We all know how frustrating it is to push on a pulled door. To add to the confusion, I installed one of the doors horizontally. So the only way you could enter is by rolling in. I've also switched from telephones to walkie-talkies. Is it possible to tap smoke signals? When I am away from the house, I now leave the garbage disposal on, so everyone will think that I am home. Much cheaper than an alarm system. Finally, and I know I may be going overboard with this, I recently got a bomb-sniffing dog, and apparently, I have explosives in my crotch. It is not easy being in the public eye or the private eye, for that matter. But for years, I have told my therapist that I suspected my phone was being tapped she said that was ridiculous, and that I was just being paranoid. Well, <laughs> those recent revelations finally proved me right. Now, maybe she'll believe me about the boogeyman in the basement. Op-ed, New York Times, Kevin Nealon, please welcome my guest today, Kevin, how are you? Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great reading. I'd like to leave my resume. I believed it. <laughs> Did you I believe it? You were very believable. Yeah. I thought it happened to you too. <laughs> right? Yeah, because your name is Kevin as well. Uh, it's, it's so amazing to me that um, you were not only able to survive this sort of ridiculousness, yeah. but sense of humor intact, and then actually write something with that sort of comedic clarity. Where else could I go with it? You know, if I let it get to me, I wouldn't be here right now. Right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I do know what you're saying. <laughs> I've got, uh, I've got two ears and a heart. Um, are you, in fact, a Cards fan, or just uh, you drifted to no, Connecticut in, uh, so young? Yeah, I was, I was born in St. Louis. That was it. Then my father graduated from uh, St. Louis University like two weeks later, and we left. We got in the car. <laughs> I hated the place. I got in the car and I split. <laughs> you know, you lasted two weeks. Yeah, but you know what? When you were born in St. Louis, uh, back then they were called the St. Louis Browns, I think. Yes. And they would automatically give you a contract to try out for the team when you were <laughs> eighteen wow. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and so. Uh, and you did. And I did. And. Uh, but you, but, you uh, won't root for him. No, I won't root for them. <laughs> Fuck them. I like to root against people. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> what do you hope comes? I'm like from? a shot and fraud fan. Uh huh. Except for you know actors and stuff. No, but no, no. For sporting you know, like teams. Right. I like to root against. Who are you currently rooting against right now? Yeah, you know, and it makes no sense too. You know, I like the underdogs to win. Right. So when somebody's you know whether it's in golf or in basketball, right. I always kind of root for the underdog to win, and I kind of hoping that the guy that's always winning kind of steps back a little bit. You know. Right. I like a good underdog story. Rocky. 
I like that one. That was like one of my favorite films. And you must have a strange uh, uh, dichotomy and conflict going on inside of you. I mentioned the dog killer earlier. That's got to be rough for you because he's a little bit of an underdog now, pun intended. <clears throat> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think he should be allowed to, Michael Vick should be allowed to play football again, but without pads. No helmet, <laughs> no cup, you know. <laughs> Listen, I'm not here to judge, all right? <laughs> oh, you're not, a, you're not here to judge. No, I'm not here to then judge. I stand corrected. The love of my life is 27. I clearly believe in second chances. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I understand that. Mm -hmm. So, I'm all about second chances. I just think when, when you actually kill dogs for sport, there's no second chance. Okay, well, I'm going to... Pro try to sit with good posture today. All right, let's both do that. I'm working on my posture. Are you? Because I'm a, kind of a tall guy, you know. You are. You're I have a height range five eight to six four. <laughs> but you know when I and, and, and typically I'm kind of rounded shouldered, you know, because I'm, I, counters are pretty low everywhere, and so I'm always like this, or I'm talking to people that are shorter than me. But now I, you know, and I, I can't do it. I can't correct it too much. If I overcorrect it like this, then you, it's like who wants a piece of this when I walk into a room? You know, <laughs> who wants a piece of this? Right. So I have to kind of keep it just right there moderately. You know, is it tough to find that spot? It is tough. In fact, you know that runner they, they recently thought was maybe a guy? Yes. They did a test. Uh -huh. They found out that she has internal male organs, and uh, which would explain why whenever she got aroused, her posture would improve. I see what you're saying. You know, greatly. She got erect. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it possible that Andy Kaufman, Albert Brooks, and Steve Martin were all influences on your, uh, you as a stand-up? How did you know that? I do a little research. You have done some research. <laughs> yes, I It is. I was always a big fan of Steve Martin's. I yeah. was a fan of uh, Andy Kaufman's and Albert Brooks, and I got to uh, meet all of them and work with all of them except Andy Kaufman. Although I did have like a, maybe a two, he had a two hour conversation with me in front of the improv once about transcendental meditation. Did transcendental? You? All of those work. All transcendental. Of those work. The pizza was good. The pizza was delicious. Okay, good. Um, so you did chat with Andy. I did. Yeah, I did. I used to watch him. You know, I, I worked as a bartender at the Improv right. in Hollywood for a so couple did of years. So did Les Moonves. He did. <laughs> he worked in the back. Yeah. <laughs> at the same time as me. He was your back bar, really. He was. He was. And every time we see each other, we kind of laugh about that. And um, is it hard to see him because he's pretty at a pretty lofty perch now? Oh, I have I have access. I have, yeah. Of course. I just <laughs> I tell him we need uh, more rum in the front bar. And it's a matter of habit for him. He comes carrying it out. <laughs> I love when Letterman kept showing a scene that Les had done from some. Yeah, he was an actor back yeah. then. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah. For a while, Letterman would not let it go, and every night he would just keep showing this scene. <laughs> and the president of the network. Uh, yeah, had, yeah. Had done a bad episode of The Love Boat or something. Yeah. Um, well. So you did work with well, you worked with Albert Brooks, buddy. I worked with Albert Brooks on uh, Weeds last That's season, right. two seasons ago. Yes, of course. And uh, and here's a guy you know I've met a few times before, but never really got to talk to him. But um, and I remember I saw him do stand up at the Improv once. It was yeah. an open mic night, and he just decided to come down. And I reminded him of this too, and he he remembered. He came down from the Hollywood Hills. He called to see if he could come down and do some time. Right. And I I took the phone call. Because I was working at the bar then. Right. And uh, I said, sure, yeah, come on down. And he came down with a couple of buddies. I don't know if they were stoned or what. But he, he got up on stage, and there was only maybe like 20 people in the room. Oh, my God. And, and then um, he did, must have done like two hours. Just hilarious, you know, just going on and on. So then I got to work with him. And I loved all his movies, too, you know, Modern Romance and Lost in America. Uh, That's two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, and then just to sit down with him, like in between takes on Weeds and yeah. waiting, and just kind of talking to him about... Saturday Night Live and his career and stuff, and uh, I didn't really let on that I was a huge fan. I was just going, oh, really? You did stand up as well? <laughs> you Interesting. Interesting. You didn't, did you remind him that you took the phone call? <laughs> no. At the Improv? No. See, I remember also uh, a similar situation at the Improv where I, when I first moved to LA, did not live too far from there because that was my home club. And I got a call, I think it was from Jimmy Miller actually saying, Albert Brooks just walked into the improv, he's at the round table, you've got to come down here. Because I started doing an impersonation of him. You did the best impersonation of him. And I got onto the Larry yeah. King show doing it, and, and it, it had gone pretty far. And once I was on Larry's show and Albert called in, so it, it had its, a life of its own, but I'd never met him face to face. So I rushed down there and he's sitting at Bud's table, the round table, Yeah. right? And every chair is taken at the table. So now I'm like, I'm hovering around. He's telling a story. So anyways, my father, hey, Kevin, how's it going? Sit down. My father uh, was a radio comic, and he, Kevin, seriously, you're making me nervous. He had, for 20 minutes, he told a story, and 
haggled me about sitting down, and there was no place to sit. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then it was, uh, he had been uh, nominated for Broadcast News, so he went on stage in a similar thing and improvised for 45, 50 minutes about why Sean Connery was going to win and how he had no chance against James Bond, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he was one of my heroes, too, in stand-up. And then somebody told me a story about him, um, and, I, and I, uh, I reminded him of this, and he agreed. He was at a, uh, I think it was a Carrie Fisher party, and he got a big laugh, and then he said, I gotta go, I gotta go, and he left. <laughs> and then somebody else left like a half hour later, he's still in the parking lot. And they go, Albert, what, I thought you left. So I did, but you know, I forgot my keys. Why don't you go get them? I got out on a big laugh. I, I can't top that. Would you go back and get them for me? <laughs> that is a great story that I. Heard. And then I worked with Richard Lewis for a while, you know, on Hiller and Diller, huge right. hit. Right, right. But he used to call me to kind of go, over, you know, talk about the show and stuff. And he, um, if he ever got a big laugh on the phone, he would just hang up. You know, he, he Richard Lewis. Yeah, I would laugh, and and then I go, that's funny, Richard. So, Richard, because <laughs> he wanted to get out on a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> in a conversation. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. The comedians are not fucked up. Mm -mm. <laughs> There's no chance. Um, you started doing stand-up in college, is that right? That is incorrect. Uh, all right. When did you start? I started uh, a couple years after college. Ah. Yeah. What I did was I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I keep reminding you to sit up. You know what I did? I, um, I used to memorize the jokes in the back of the parade section. Uh, the parade magazine. It was, Always They had good. my favorite jokes, mm -hmm. like Stanley Myron Handelman, a lot of those old-timers. Mm -hmm. And I would kind of personalize them and tell them at little parties around our, you know, our neighborhood, you know. And somebody said, you should go to New York and check out, like, the Catch Rising Star and some of those clubs, the improv. So I went in there and I, and I went to the Catch Rising Star and it was just so intimidating. You know, it's a little crowded club like this. Everybody's sitting, crushed in and smoking. Yeah, yeah. And the comics are on stage. It's like Belzer yeah. and uh, Barry Diamond. Sure. You know, a lot of those guys. Tough kind of New York comics, you know. And I thought, oh, my God, I can't do this. I can't. This is not. And I heard, like. California was laid back. I'd never been to California. I thought, I should go out there. I could kind of check it out and then try the stand-up, too. It's more laid back out there, you know. And so uh, came out here after a couple, about a year after college. To pursue the laid well, backness? Well, I was uh, pursuing stand-up comedy and also football. I want to throw a lot of stuff at you here right now. <laughs> I played um, a year of uh, no, you didn't. college football at Fairfield University. No, no. I took a night course so I could play. <laughs> I had graduated from my school. Right. It was a business school. My school. That was a college, Way before my school. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and um, and I played soccer there, but I never played organized football. I played sandlot football. Right. And um, and I always wanted to play. My friend played. He, he had an idea. He goes, "Let's take a night course there," because he did it the year before. Jeez. And um, and they needed a quarterback. <laughs> And so I came on, and I took the night course in criminology. I think we went to two classes. Right. And we played a full season of uh, football. So I wanted to come out, and I did well. And I wanted to come out to California. That's when they had the USFL, right. United States Football League. Right. I thought, okay, they're not probably as good as the NFL. Sure. So maybe I could get a, a job as a kicker, a punter on the, which is what I was going to, I was also punting in college. Right. And so. Litnikoff uh, was your hero, quarterback. Yes. Punter, kicker. Yeah. yeah. So um, my, my uh, strategy was to do stand up. And kind of have the football thing as kind of like a fallback, not a fallback, but kind of as a gimmick. You know, like oh, he's also the kicker. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's true when you're starting. It's like, what is my angle? Yeah. What is my bit? But anyway, the comedy started taking off before the football thing. Thank God. And I had like, you know, I had like ten footballs. You, I still have them at home. The USFL football is a little bit lighter than the NFL. And I used to practice kicking at Fairfax uh, High School. Is that right? Day. Yeah. Let's take a break. We'll come back. Okay. <laughs> That's actually. I think Fairfax, that um, the track is where Albert shot the scene in Modern Romance when he's saying, one, two, three, I don't even miss her, two, three, yeah, he's about yeah. to run, yeah. and he runs into the phone booth and calls her. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, notice they don't have a lot of uh, pay phones around anymore. <laughs> they're really hard to find. When I see somebody on a pay phone now, I'm thinking they're up to no good. <laughs> right. you know, what, why are they using the pay phone? Or a secret agent. Yeah. It's one or the other. <laughs> um, so, when you came out here, you said that the... the I'm sorry, help, help me with your name again. <laughs> what was it? Clevin. 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 Right. Um, you said that you, when you came out here and the stand-up started taking off a little bit more. So, was it the improv? Was that the place that you That's where I went, got yeah. on stage? Because right. I remember the first time I went to uh, the club in New York, Catch a Rising Star, and I, I had a similar sort of experience in terms of the look and feel of it. And I remember one night Larry David just got on stage, he looked at the crowd and went, 
Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> and walked on stage. I, I saw him a few times on stage, and he would get into, he was very sensitive about hecklers yeah. or people talking. And on, on several occasions, he called people out, out into the street, to have it out with them. <laughs> <laughs> and he's serious. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's serious. But all the times I went to the Catch a Rising Star, I never caught a rising star. No, 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 never. They, never. No. I never caught one. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a fire. False fly. advertising. Yeah. So yeah. you started working at the improv, first as a bartender, and then um, you got on stage. I was the worst bartender. I didn't know how to make any drinks. Uh, the <laughs> Did you literally just say, I, I, let well, me be the bartender? Well, the bartender that, that was there, he, we became friends, and he offered me a job. He knew I was an aspiring comic. It would be great to work there, and uh, you know, I could meet all the comics. And I started seeing comics that were actually on television. Sure. You know? I thought, wow, yeah, Donnie Archibald, you know, yeah, right, right. And, Skip uh, Stevenson, Skip was Stevenson, just there. yeah. And um, so it was a great opportunity. And so I got the Boston Bartender's Guide. You know, it tells you how to make drinks. I kept it down below, and I just prayed that nobody would order anything other than a beer or a wine. You know, <laughs> seven and seven. Okay, I got that. You know, and I thought the more alcohol I put in, it was a college mentality. I thought they would like it more. You know, if I put a lot of alcohol in, and people always come back and say, "Can you, can you put a little more ginger ale in here?" <laughs> <laughs> and I would never take the tips. I was afraid that they weren't really the tips. I thought they just kept their money on the. <laughs> and, and one time I took a tip, and I was whoa, 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 whoa. So from that point on, I would wait. I would look out the window until they actually left the place and drove away, and then I would take it. <laughs> oh, the memories. But it was good because I got to uh, work there, and then if some a comic didn't show up, but Freeman, the owner, would right. put me on. Right. Oh, you know? nice. Yeah. So and then that, I, and that happens a lot. And I would bomb in the room. Right. And then I come back to angry uh, patrons out in the bar because <laughs> where were you been? It I was a win-win. Win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a win-win. Where have you been? I was getting my ass handed to me by the audience. Mm -hmm. What can I get mm -hmm. you? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you like another beer? <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> Help me again. Where do I know you? <laughs> I was in Willow. <laughs> That's right. I've been on mugs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so... Uh, I feel like I'm interviewing for a job here. <laughs> well, in many so ways... So anyway, when can I start? <laughs> in many ways you are, and let's not get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because it says here that you, you made your Tonight Show uh, debut. Can I just tell tonight? you one, one thing that you don't have in this paper? <laughs> okay. When I first moved to um, Other than California, uh -huh. um, I got a job... Uh, Working through manpower, a lot of temporary jobs. No, no. But um, manpower. Um, manpower. Is there a <laughs> misunderstanding? <laughs> I hope this helps me with the job. Um, but I, w I lived in San Diego for a couple of months. Did you? And my buddy and I would go to all these restaurants and we'd fill out the resume. And, and I put down like I worked as a waiter, like at the Lobster Barrel and the sure. Steak and Ale and everything. And it was all fake. Sure. And I would put down fake phone numbers. Right. And uh, we went to this one restaurant. Um, in San Diego, that was really nice, and uh, the guy called, and my friend wouldn't lie on the resume. He, he, uh, okay, I, said, I said, John, you got to put something down, otherwise you're not going to get hired as a waiter. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to check. <laughs> so uh, he were went you, in. So you were legitimately trying to get jobs as a waiter? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Because if you give a false number, how are they going <laughs> to hire you? Well, I figured they wouldn't check. I was going on that premise. But they'd have to call you to give you the job. No, no. They, I gave them my phone number. Okay. But the fake phone number of the restaurant Previous where I Got, yeah. it. Got it. Steak and ale. So uh, John went in, and he was out like in two minutes. <laughs> and, I, and as he's walking, I said, John, I told you you should put something. I go inside, and the guy's going. He's looking at it. He goes, that's very impressive. You work here. And I go, yep. And uh, he says, can you start on um, you know the Friday before Thanksgiving, which is the next week? I said, sure. Yeah. I can start then. And he goes, okay, that looks good then. And uh, do you mind if I just call um, a couple of these places, uh, you know, where you worked, where I worked? And uh, I said, yeah, you can do that, <laughs> but um, we've got another interview we got to run to right now. And uh, <laughs> but um, there's my number. You could call me afterwards. Let me know what they said. <laughs> I, I don't want to be there. here. I pulled my fridge out. I said, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> it's amazing what we set ourselves up for. And then truly, what's the worst thing that could have happened? But I'll tell you what happened from that. Sure. We didn't get that job. Yes. And I didn't answer any phone calls for the next few days. Yeah. You know? But um, we both got jobs working as department store Santa Clauses in, uh, in San Diego. Is that true? Yeah. I've yeah. got to hear at least one gem from that experience. Either a kid shit on your lap, something. <laughs> well, that did happen. <laughs> you got a lot of kids coming over from Tijuana, and they didn't speak English. Right. And uh, and then the, the kids that did speak English, their parents were very annoyed. They'd be yelling from the sideline, Johnny, tell them what you want. Tell them what you want, Johnny. Tell them about the big wheel. Johnny, Johnny. <laughs> you know. And, uh, and but, um, 
I did. Um, That's a lot of pressure for a kid. It is a lot of pressure. Because he's nervous being on Santa's lap. And I swear to you, they're peeing on you. They're smelly. <laughs> well, they don't mean to pee on you. They don't you. mean. We scotch guarded the lap, you know, after the first week. <laughs> sure. But uh, it was, it was, uh, and um, I, um, I had, a, I got a little thing going with my elf. Oh, really? And when I say elf, you mean? I'm talking about the the 21 year old, the 18 year old, and the elf outfit who's taking the pictures, which is how they make the money at Sears with the Santa thing. Uh huh. She came by one night and <laughs> you know what this means, right? Nope. <laughs> I really don't. How about this? <laughs> that I know. That you yeah, know. yeah. You got some of that? Yeah. We got some. Whoa! Wow. <laughs> wow. My and first. Yeah, yeah. Well, sure, because yeah. that usually happens much later. Yeah. It's amazing that you barely knew when you got that. But eventually. We ended up like this. <laughs> Holy crap! Yeah. This is your first wife. No. No, no, no. No. Misunderstood. No. Uh, <laughs> Could somebody help me get and out release. of this? <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember you doing a, a classic bit on stage that I, I, it was amazing to me because I saw you do it at least a dozen times that I didn't, I didn't want to see anyone. Really? Because I usually do just one bit once and that's <laughs> it. I move on. No. You're not that genius. I'm very prolific. <laughs> um, but it, it was the, with the easel and the and the black chalk and the and uh, I never saw any of them catch on to it. But there, someone must have in a show. Occasionally they would catch on. Uh, what would happen is I would be sketching their picture and I have charcoal, and as eventually I would start moving their face right. with this hand that had charcoal all over it. Right. And, and it they didn't know face. Yeah. that by and the end of it know. they were basically. And I would show them at the end with a mirror, and the yeah. audience knew they could see it, and everybody would go have a good time with it. Yeah. But um, occasionally somebody would tell them in the audience, oh. like they would go. He's putting shit on your face. Yeah, and that happened on TV once. Oh, where God. Where the, the girl's friend told her, put me on your face. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but one time I was up near San Francisco doing a show in, in some club, and it was a drunk girl. She came up, and oh. she was just being kind of silly the whole time. Right. I was drawing her, and I was, you know, and she pretended she was going to pour the drink on my head, and the audience is going, do it, do right, it, of course. do it. Be this is before I got any charcoal on her at all. <laughs> I was just asking her silly questions and drawing, right. you know, bad picture. And... Um, and finally, she, she throws the, she pours it on my head. I said, "Okay, okay." The eyes going crazy. I said, "Oh, we're just having fun." All right, now let me draw your picture. And I got her face so black, <laughs> it was so black. I wouldn't stop because she was drunk. She didn't know. I mean, there was not one piece of like flesh left that wasn't covered in black. She looked like blackface. She was Mrs. Al Jolson yeah. before the show was over. And typically, I show the person. You know, but her I didn't show. No. And I just let her go back to her seat. She was rude. And I got off the stage right away. And I was really pissed. In fact, she went back in the hotel. It was like a, she, it was like a, uh, one of those uh, sticky drinks. I don't know what they're called. It was a bartender, but I don't know what it was. It was a vodka gimlet or something. Right. And, uh, and I'm in the back room. It's the office. That's the green room. Sure. And I'm waiting to, I'm listening to her to find out when she realizes she has it on her face. And they told her. And I hear the audience go, whoa, get him, get him, get him. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and you know she's coming and out And she here. came busting into the room, <laughs> and she had a beer that she was shaking. She was going <laughs> to oh, And I grabbed the beer from her, and I started holding it. This is crazy. <laughs> so it always went well. No. No. <laughs> and one other time I did it to uh, this, this woman, and uh, the guy came up afterwards. He had it rolled up in his hand. And he's hitting it. He's going. I just want you to know that you ruined uh, my girl's evening. It's her birthday and my evening. You know, we were loving you up until that point. Oh God! And then you just ruined it. Yeah. I said, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, where is where is she? She's in the bathroom crying. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. And we talked for a while. And by the time she she came out, right. kind of playing like nice, you know. And uh, by the time they left, they say, "Hey, so when, where are you going to be next? We'd love to come and see you." <laughs> <laughs> you you talked them off the clock tower with the M16. Like, yeah. It's oh, like you're God. a car salesman and somebody brings back the car, they don't like it, and then by the time they leave, you convince them, you know, to buy another car and to keep that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's... You don't know what I'm talking that's about. <laughs> <laughs> that's part of the comedian's job, is to sell themselves. So, you know, you already had plenty of experience there. Yeah, Come you on. are a salesman as a comic. Yeah. You know, you got to travel there with your stuff. And I mean, you have, I think I've always said, you have literally two minutes to completely sell the audience that they should relax. Yeah, and that they're in good hands. Yeah, you got to let them know that you're confident and relaxed. Yeah, in fact, I, I remember when I first started out, one of the higher up, more successful comedians in San Francisco said, 
You know, when your material catches up with your stage presence, you're really going to have an act. Because <laughs> he was basically saying, you're cocky for no reason. <laughs> and it was true. Here's what I always, I was so frustrated when you start out doing stand-up, because it's so hard to come up with a style and, uh, yeah. you know, um Because you start emulating your Yeah, heroes. everybody's, I mean, when I started out, people were emulating Steve Martin and, and um, you know, Richard Pryor. And, right. And those types. Letterman. And, um... Uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> you were going to say. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, why can't every established comic just give me one of their jokes? It doesn't have to be their best joke, but a joke that works, you know? Yeah. Then I would have like 20 minutes. Right. And then, um, you know, I wouldn't have to go through all this crap of trying to come up with material and style. Yeah. But uh, I never really went around to ask them. <laughs> but I would, you know, if some new comic came into town now and came up to me and said, hey, listen, I'm going to each comic asking for one of their jokes. Could you help me out? Which one would you give them? I'd give them a joke. Which one? I got something that I did on my special, maybe. Right, right. Um, <laughs> Tell me again your name. <laughs> Lenny? Lenny. Lenny Len Len. Lenny Len Len. Um, I've got to hear a little bit about your first Tonight Show, just because, you know, I, I don't know. I, th I just think it's such a milestone. Do you think comics now, like younger comics, really care about, like, Johnny Carson and... I know like, comics like our age, when we started out, <laughs> right. that was the show to do. Well, because but now I don't even put it on my, like... <laughs> you didn't like to talk about it. I kind of date you a little bit, I guess. <laughs> no. Tell me when you were on with Steve Allen. Buddy, what it kills that me like? that I can't... That I'm sure I haven't talked to... I should, I should have asked Dana about this, but it kills me that I can't even do the impression on stage. Because half the audience is like, what's, what's, what's he doing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Who's yeah. he doing? Who's that? Well, for me, you know, I always try to uh, get on The Tonight Show like everybody else. For, with Johnny Carson and um, but Macaulay Jim Macaulay was the talent coordinator at the yeah. time and um, and whenever he was in the room and you know in a club people would just go crazy you know yeah. they either leave or right. they didn't want to be on stage or some wanted to be on stage yeah. and you could feel his presence there so to audition in front of him it was the most nerve wracking thing for me I've, I had sweat dripping out of places I never had sweat back, down the back of my legs right. I never had it why would there be sweat there? <clears throat> and I think I auditioned for him like maybe four times over a period of three years, right. never got anything. And then one day he had me audition for um, a Mike Nesmith show. Show and Mike Nesmith from Elephant Monkeys. Parts. Was it Elephant uh, Parts? Because I, I remember, remember he did a video show. It was called Elephant. Parts. Might have anyway. done that. So you. And he, so I thought I'm, I'm going to do just anything. I'm going to do material that I think that I think is funny, and I'm not going to try to like customize it for the Tonight Show. You know what I think they they like. So I did that, and then I'm on my way to um, Houston to do a gig, and he calls me. I, I check my machine, and there's a message from him. Give him a call. He goes, I got good news and bad news. The bad news is, um, I don't think you're right for the Mike Nesmith show. The good news is, we'd like you to do the Tonight Show with Jeez. Johnny. Oh my God. And I almost dropped the phone. <laughs> no you know kidding. I mean? And um, no, that's that's a moment in time that yeah. your heart just goes to a different place. So I had like maybe five days before I was going to be on. Oh my God. And you know, you've done it before. You go over and over your five minute act. You know, yeah. non-stop even as you're eating and yeah. you're talking to people you're going over your act is that right <laughs> yeah no kidding no? in your head you're going over your act you can't hear anything yeah and then um, so the day comes and the uh, I'm standing backstage with Jim McCauley who's next to me and he was kind of uh, a goofy guy yeah he was but he's trying to make me feel relaxed and he had those wingtip shoes and he was kind of dancing around like backstage trying to loosen me up what? you know and I'm, I'm, try I'm still going over my act in my head I'm looking he's like more distracting than anything else. I mean, yeah. what is he doing? What the fuck? You know, man? and then you hear Johnny out there on this next guy. Yeah, you know. he's a little weird. And then, yeah, a little weird. Uh, and then the band's playing out. Dan it, dan it, dan it, dan You know, and you, the curtain opens up, and I forgot my act. <laughs> no. As I'm walking out no, to the tee, I completely blanked. But I'm smiling like I still know it. I know what I'm doing. You know? <laughs> did you really? I, I did. But by the time I got to that little mark, it came back. And by the time they started applauding, it came back. Oh. And I was so relieved. And, and you're doing your act, and I was so nervous. My, I had the cotton mouth, you know? Yeah. But oh, I was yeah. getting a lot of laughs. And I would smile, and my lip would stick up there like that, you know? <laughs> and I didn't want them to know that I was nervous, so I, I wouldn't, didn't want to lick it, you no. know? So I let it stay up there, and I adjusted by bringing the bottom one up, like that, you know? And, um, mm. but it went well, and you could hear Johnny laughing and stuff. And I go backstage, and Jim McCulley's back there, and he goes, okay, stick around. I think Johnny's going to want to talk to you. I, don't, I said, what? On the, on the uh, panel, he goes, yeah, on the couch. Oh, what, 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 what can he talk to you about? And I felt like saying to him, get out of my way. Johnny wants to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need you been. anymore. <laughs> you know? That would have been awesome. So, yeah, that was it. That, in a nutshell, that's what happened. Yeah. Well, that's pretty spectacular. It was... Um, my uh, first time I got bumped. Oh, you know, sorry. everyone, yeah. most guys got, had that bump the comics were there. experience. But I was bumped because Sammy Davis Jr., may he rest in peace. Oh, what happened? 
He sang for he died. Oh no. <laughs> that's, that's what you that's meant. That's a good reason to get bumped. <laughs> yes. He <laughs> sang four songs. Nice. Yeah. You ever remember anyone singing four songs no. on the Tonight Show? No. You, you'd have to be Sammy Davis to get two songs. Yeah. And the son of a bitch sang four songs. But and I, you know how it is, you call everyone you've ever known. I'm going to be on the Tonight yeah, Show know, tonight, right? And so there's that moment where you're about to get bumped. I'm kicking the walls in the dressing room. <laughs> Suddenly, it's like, you know, I actually belong there, which was absurd. And because I know, just mainly because I have to know I have to call 74 people to say, yeah, I know. It. <laughs> right. I know. Horrific. Um, yeah, that, that's the worst. That's the worst. It's Pollock. Pollock, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And where do I know you from? <laughs> things. Mm, things. Yeah, yeah, just things. things. That's yeah. probably best. Yeah, to leave it general that way. And the other thing about the Tonight Show, yes, sir, is uh, for when I did it, I had um, I saved, I still have it to this day. I have the uh, the tape from my answering machine of all the other comics telling me uh, no how fun way. it was. And it was great. That would and be incredible. How, how, did, how did you have the thing to, to know to save them? That's brilliant. I save a lot. I got I got answering machines from old girlfriends. <laughs> you know? Do you? That should I'm be. I'm so in the sorry, act. Kev. I'm, you know, it just didn't work out with us. I mean, start eating again. Really, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> well, those you are know, you're just, those are good to keep. Oh yeah, I yeah. do. I have a lot of that in the storage unit. All oh, right. Do I, you have a storage yeah, unit? Yeah, I do, and one just for that. <laughs> just for the tape. One tape. <laughs> oh, just one tape. Because <laughs> you don't think it should be crowded. It's an eight by ten uh, storage unit. <laughs> Feet. The tape is maybe about this big. <laughs> right. <laughs> I so, keep it in a little case. But I love that you remember that Riser was on the list. Riser of people was People who called you. Listen, Kevin, I just wanted to say that the show was really... Uh, it, it, well, let me just say, it went well. <laughs> <laughs> as, as these things can go. I always say yours went well. <laughs> right? Um, I was thinking, if I was an impressionist, what um, who actors... Would you, who, who would I do? Because yeah, I want to do, do absurd ones, you know? And here's who I would do. I would do... Um, um, John Malkovich. Nice! Because he hosted Saturday Night Live once when I was on there. And I kind of just listened to him. I do I, I do people's walks. I like to do the I do impressions of people's walks. Oh, nice. That's what I do. But his his is kind of effeminate in a way. Yes. I'm sure you probably do him, but it's kinda like I think that this show is it's and then when he gets angry he just gets a little more you know, um, he goes, I think this show is fine just the way it is. But what makes me mad is when sometimes when people don't understand <laughs> what's going on. <you> know, <laughs> Really? But it, it is a little effeminate. But um, yeah. so I would do a Malkovich. I would probably do John Lithgow. Nice. Uh, just those two. That would be it. Yeah. What would it be like if John Lithgow got in a fight with John Malkovich? That's your opening. <laughs> That's how I'd probably set it up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who would you do? Well, here's the thing. I've learned over the years. You have to be careful. Uh, because for a while there, a lot of people were doing uh, Chris Walken. Yes. And it just got oversaturated. Right? Yeah, everybody was doing it. almost it. seems hackneyed now. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you had to do one, one man. Man. <laughs> there you go. Man says. That's I it. can't. I'm not impressionist. Here's what I always thought. Here's what I always thought, Ken. I mean, Kevin. Uh-huh. Um, at one point, I wanted to be an impressionist. Really? Yeah. In high school, I used to kind of like we're working on Johnny Cash, you know, and, and uh, those kinds of things, Jimmy Stewart. Uh huh. And uh, then I thought, wait a minute, do I want to be impersonating people, or do I want other people to be impersonating me? See what you did? You turned it around, and now look how many guys are doing you. You've got um, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> we could have gone down the list. We could have. We could have. Um, no. No, I find that uh, you have to be careful because my fear now is that over the years, one of these people is going to take it the wrong way. Like I started messing around with Jason Statham, you know, the new uh, action hero. He did the Crank movies and the. Uh, I first saw him in Snatch, and he, I thought he was great. Fucking yeah. eight pikeys. Yeah. But um, I started messing around with him on stage, and I thought, you know, I, I, I don't actually don't know if I should be doing this guy because I'm afraid to get that phone call. Do you know who I fucking am? <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm the man who's going to rip you into little tiny pieces. I'm going to swallow those pieces and then I'm going to shit them out. Yeah. And then I'm going to make you eat that shit before you die. Do you know who I am now? Do you know, right? <laughs> I don't want that phone call. So I'm, I'm not, But those I'm, phone calls never come. But I'm not, I, I was surprised when I was on Saturday Night Live. Um, no matter how much you made fun of people, they were flattered by it. Right. Dana would do the impressions of a lot of people, oh, and God. he would get like you know gifts from them stuff. And I did like you know I did a few impressions like Sam Donaldson. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I remember Dana was on his show once, and as they're leaving, he he goes to Dana he goes, "When's that fellow doing me again?" 
Nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're thinking, I'm making so, fun yeah. of the guy with so the hair. So people and, don't care. Yeah. They, they, and the they Larry like King. It. You did the Larry, Larry King. King. Yeah. Um, King's things. I ran into Larry King in front of um, some deli in Beverly Hills. Nate Nows is there yeah, every day. Yeah, he's there every day. He told me, he said, I'm here every day at 9 a.m. <laughs> 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 but he would, uh, right off the bat, he was with somebody. He goes, go ahead, do me. Get it over with. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Did he really? I said, what do you mean, do you? <laughs> that's, that's awkward. Yeah, not here, Larry. Not now. <laughs> not here, not now. Not ever. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to. Roanoke, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have something we do on the game, on the game, on the show called the Larry King Game. And um, had you seen the show, you would know what it is. But. Tell me again the name of the show. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we have the audience participate as well. What yeah, it's I, a great audience, too. Right? It's, it's got to be twos of threes of people here. <laughs> there are twos of threes. Um, no, the, the audience watching live. No, there's a lot of people. There's watching. actually people watching. No, I know. I yeah. realize that. There's got to be. There's, uh, there, you we have, have a good a following. Fans that came in this week. We have twos and threes. And then we have a chat room where they get live questions. Oh, For nice. example, what is the after effect of being on a show about pot? Did it hinder or make people frown in any way? Yeah, I got to tell you, the most surprising thing for me is being on Weeds is how, how well um, received it is across the board. I, I could be walking in a mall and some 18 year old comes up to me, dude, love the show, man, love the show. Go around the corner, there's like three 75 year old ladies. Oh, honey, we love that show you're on. It's, it's hilarious. Right. And they so, think you're Bob Saget, but still. Yeah, full house. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to correct them. But. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm surprised about that. I thought we'd be getting letters and stuff, but I think times have just kind of changed and people accept things, you know, and nothing is really that shocking to people. I think a lot of people can relate to that show because the characters are yeah. pretty, um, you know, reality-based. Yeah, especially when the cock got slammed in the desk this year. If, if you want reality-based, you needn't look any further. Tell me your name again. <laughs> <laughs> because that was that was a pretty special moment for all men. Yeah. yeah. We all suffered through that with with you, and I thought it was pretty clever the way they cut to the lady out at the front. Oh, of the we did so many takes on that on that cut of close ups of me, like you know, ready to the camera. <laughs> 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 yeah. You know, spit coming out, and there's no underselling that pain. To yeah. be honest. Yeah. There's no, no matter what you do, they're not going to go, yeah, give me less. But we did so many takes, and, you know, I mean, where you're really, like, grimacing, and your face is red, and, you know, <laughs> and then you watch the show, and they don't show any of that. They just cut away here. <laughs> <laughs> and you're thinking, I give, and I give, and I give. <laughs> right? And nothing. And how many times can you have that slammed in a drawer? Do you need some more vodka? I do, please. Thank okay. you. Um, I think the canter you have here. Right. We don't mess around. We, have you tried the uh, Dan Aykroyd's, the uh, Crystal Skull vodka? No, I heard that he's into that whole um, importing the liquor thing. Well, he's got a vineyard, but he also, we have it on the show a couple times. Kind of, a vodka vineyard? It's in a Crystal Skull. Nice. The, the uh, decanter, if you will, the bottle. Yeah. Is a Crystal Skull, and we highly recommend it. We'd like him to be a sponsor, too, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know a little bit about your experience in the, in the auditioning process for Saturday Night Live. Because that is kind of where the the sort of behind the scenes stuff that most people don't know kind of begins. That seems to interest a lot of people. Yeah. At the time, I was not even interested in being on Saturday Night Live. I was not a sketch player. Right. I was not a uh, impressionist. You're pure monologist. Character. I wanted to do stand up comedy. Right. And um, I was dating Jan Hooks at the time, and she was up for the show that summer of '86. Right. And Dana was already selected to be on the show, and Dana was renting a, an apartment, uh, a, a studio apartment above the garage in this house that me and a couple other comics lived right. in, in Hollywood. And so I knew Dana from that and from stand up comedy, and we used to run together on the Hollywood Reservoir. And, um, and so Dana calls me, um, and I was also reading Backstage Live you know, during that summer because I was excited for Jan and right. for Dana. Right. But it wasn't something that I, I, I knew I would never get on there. You right. know, I wasn't even prepared to. And, you know, occasionally um, they would come through town looking for people and only the, the big agents got their clients auditions. Right. So I thought, ah, you know, I like doing stand-up. That's what I do. So, um, so Dana calls me from uh, Lauren's house one, uh, one night in the late summer. And he goes, you're not going to believe this. I'm, I'm at Lauren's house and I'm dancing. And guess who's in the other room? Paul McCartney and Chevy Chase. I said, you're kidding me. Said, Get me on that yeah, show. Yeah. <laughs> now you want to <laughs> Get me on that show. <laughs> he said, uh, you know, they're looking for one more uh, cast member. And um, I gave them your name. And uh, I think he probably gave me your name, too. <laughs> I think he did. Yeah. Anybody named Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
And uh, I said, yeah, okay, that's cool. That's cool. Never thinking anything would come of it. And then, uh, and then he called me again. He goes, I'm at Lawrence again. Guess who's in the kitchen? That's Paul Simon. <laughs> Dan Aykroyd. You know. I said, wow. He goes, I think they're going to want to see your tape. Can you send the tape in? He's always whispering. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was like he was pilfering through the back room, you know. He shouldn't be in there. I said, you better get out of it before Paul McCartney catches you. <laughs> You're stealing stuff. <laughs> get out of his suitcase. <laughs> and so, uh, sure enough, I sent my tape in. And he calls me back the next week. I'm in Lauren's house again. <laughs> Guess who's in the other room? I told him I'd leave, but I haven't. <laughs> Jake, uh, Jake Pelicano's in the other room with a... Uh, <clears throat> I think they like your tape. I think they're going to fly you in for an audition. I never thought that would happen. Right. And, and sure enough... Uh, Guess what? <laughs> it always came from Dana. You were hired by Dana. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, so I, you know, I thought, okay, well, I'll go in. I'll, you know, I'm never going to get it, but I'll go in. I'll fly in there. What did you do? What was? What did you? I, I did my stand up, and I did because uh, my stand up is very conversational. Yeah. And uh, and I, I did a, uh, a couple of characters. Danny and I used to do just standing in the dry in our driveway, hanging around, and just doing stuff. I think we were talking about. Uh, we did two porno guys. Did you do the subliminal thing though? No. 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 Because uh, I remember I you did remember. that in your act. Yeah, it was in my act before Saturday Night. I think I did do that. Yeah, I did do that. Because that me. makes sense. Yeah. I, frankly, I don't remember what I did. And who was in the room when you did your audition? Um, it was actually in Studio 8H where they shoot the show. Wow. And um, everybody was sitting at the end of the bleachers. It was, um, you know, Nora Dunn, Dennis Miller, Dana, A. Whitney Brown. Not the Whitney Brown. Right. A. Whitney, <laughs> a. Brown. Whitney Brown. And uh, they had a camera set up there, and Lauren Michaels. And, um, and I thought it was just going to be me and a couple other people. But, you know, it's, it's so typical of Hollywood. You get on the plane, it's like everybody on the plane is flying to New York for that audition. Right. Even the pilot comes out of the cockpit. Hey, you guys think this is funny the way I walk like this? You know, I thought I'd do maybe a little character, you know. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, He's so, got a fake mustache yeah. on. So I'm thinking this is just going to be a, a free trip to uh, New York. Sure. Just enjoy it. See some shows. So I go and I audition, and uh, a week later, Lauren Michaels is out here, and um, he meets me at Brad Gray's office, who's with Brillstein Gray. And... Um, and he offers me a job. You know, he talks for maybe an hour, talks about the show, and, and I'm just listening, and uh, he offers me a job as a feature player, which meant that I would be guaranteed seven episodes, right. and I'd be on the weekend update, you know, like uh, the, whatever, you know, guess the little spots here and there. Sure. And so, uh, and that wouldn't be enough. That wouldn't be enough money, because they don't pay a lot of money on that show. It's a late night show. And sure. People think if you're on that show, you're, you're a millionaire all of a sudden. <laughs> Not but the case. You're, you're living in New York, yeah. and you're barely making ends meet, you know, it's when you first start, especially. They barely pay your rent. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we tell them that I also have to have a writer's credit, too, you know, in order to be there. And um, he said, okay. And then he excused himself to go to the restroom. And I'm in the room with uh, Brad Gray, and uh, we talked about it. He goes, you should tell him uh, he'll think about it over the weekend, and uh, he'll let him know on Monday. So he came back in, and I said, um, well, thanks. I appreciate the offer. Let me, let me think about it over the weekend. And, uh, you know, we'll talk on Monday. He goes, all right, well, you think about it over the weekend. We'll see you in New York on Monday. <laughs> you know, he saw right through it. I didn't realize that, that Brad was also managing him at the time. <laughs> and he had just taken me on, you know. So I was, you know, played like that. Yeah, know. you really were played. Yeah. Right into a job. Yeah, into a job. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny because uh, uh, there's such legend and lore surrounding that show from so many different perspectives. And... I remember Dana and I starting out in San Francisco together, we both did impersonations, we both did characters, and everyone constantly told each of us separately, whatever, you guys are perfect for Saturday Night Live, you know, because we sort of grew up as you yeah. did when the show was coming of age. And Dana got the show, and then like six months later, I got this Barry Levinson movie, Avalon, and became this dramatic actor, right? A little bit? Yeah, you did take that. But I mean, it was this, it was ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, and all I wanted was Saturday Night Live at the time. But weren't you also on Half Hour Comedy Hour? Oh, Mac no, I did uh, uh, Comedy Break with comedy Mac and break. Jamie. Yeah. Or Jan Hooks. Jan Hooks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that was great. You would have been perfect on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> no. I, what happened? <laughs> uh, they wanted a tall guy, I think. Because <laughs> no. I had nothing really to offer. You know, here, here's, uh, I mentioned the legend and lore because here's what I was told. Because you're right, Dana did submit my name. Yeah. And I did um, audition for the show also. And here's what I was told in the 11th hour. Before you sat down with Lauren in the office of Brad's, yeah. I was told by my people, you it's between, there's down to three guys for the last part. <clears throat> it's between you and Kevin Elan and Jim Carrey. And I said, well, Jim Carrey's going to get it. He hadn't been on... Uh, in Living Color. In Living Color, but if you see the guy do stand-up, you go, well, this guy's a sketch yeah. superstar. 
you can't got to get out of the way. And um, and then I think I don't know if it was Dana, but somebody called me and said, to be honest with you, they they kind of are chock full of sketch players who do impersonations because they had Phil Hartman and Dana. So then I said, well, then Neilan's gonna he's gonna definitely see. I never knew it. any of this was going on. Right? <laughs> I had no inside track and anything. <laughs> I didn't get a call from Dana. I was like, guess what? <laughs> Kevin Pollock and also Jim Carrey. Right. And I think Rick Overton was even up for the part. Yeah. And, and in fact, yeah. When they were down to tall guys, yeah. it was you and Rick Overton. <laughs> <laughs> right. I had no chance at that point. Yeah. They but said, it happened very quickly. I mean, I, I didn't even have time to tell friends that I was going to New York. It's like, pack the bags, let's go. Think about it over the weekend and I'll see you yeah. on Monday. And, and we didn't unpack our bags for a long time because that show was on the verge of getting canceled because the ratings were so low the previous year. Mm. So every you know every week we thought it's going to get canceled, and, and that, that made it easier to be on that show, that live show, that fearless. institution, because you thought, oh, this, nobody's watching this show. Right. The only people that are watching are the people in the studio. Yeah, this and thing the cameraman. Yeah. That's, well, that's how we function <laughs> here. Um, was there a sense at all, though, as an individual performer, that that you were on a, on a firing line at any point? Was there ever a sense of, oh, I better do good, otherwise they're going to replace me? Because now it seems like there's a revolving door. If you can get through one season on that show, it's a miracle. There's constantly new people. Yeah, I know. And I don't know that that was the case back then. It wasn't at that point. I right. mean, we all came in. It was a small cast. It was, I think, maybe eight of us. You right. Know? And, um, and I was a feature player, so I didn't really feel that threatened, and I didn't know what the, uh, the MO was about firing people, you know? Right. I was a feature player, so I didn't really have to be that good. Right. You know, I wasn't the starting quarterback. Right. You know, and, but and were you in fact writing also? Because I was writing too. Yeah. Well, that's writing. a huge advantage. It is. Yeah. It is. So I would be writing pretty much for myself every week. Right. You know, and I got on every show the first year, and then the second year they said, "Do you want to be a regular cast member, or do you want to keep the writing credit and be a feature player?" Because they couldn't give you the writing that's, credit and the cast. Member. That's tough. So you know, and everybody else was writing anyway. So I said, "I'll take the cast." Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because you could still write for yourself. Yeah. But nobody got fired back then, you know? It was just... And then after a while, Lawrence started bringing in a lot of people, like backups, you know? I mean, I remember, like, you know, <clears throat> you know, uh, Adam Sandler, Chris Rock, David Spade, Farley, uh, Mike Myers. You know, all these people started coming in. And then a lot of other people that didn't really stay that long, they were very talented. It just, right. for some reason, they, they didn't you know click with that show like Sarah Silverman Ben Stiller right uh, and then there was people later on like Michael McKean that were, stayed on the show for a while and Chris Elliott right Janine Garofalo was on for a season I think yeah you know so it, um, it it became very kind of uh, chaotic. It was kind of a free for all after a while. It got much more intense I'm sure in yeah. terms of stage time and sketch time. It got, it got a little competitive. competitive. It right. got to a point where you know they had a big table read. Everybody would write sketches, you know, and there'd be a stack maybe this tall. And the, the uh, as the cast got bigger, the table read on on Wednesdays became longer and longer, and uh, and they started taking people's names, the writers' names, off of the uh, the sketches because they didn't want people to be um, prejudiced to who wrote what and how much they're going to laugh at it, you know. Right. Because if you knew that somebody wrote this and you didn't, you know, you wanted to get your thing on, you wouldn't laugh so much for their thing. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that makes total sense. Yeah. Um, I want to, uh, if you don't mind, you have a brand new stand-up special out I want to talk about a little bit, too, before we uh, dive head-on into the weeds. And we, uh, first of all, can you believe an hour's gone by? Because I told you before, you won't believe I'm talking for an hour. Frankly, no. it feels like two hours to me. Like, <laughs> no, it does go like, by fast. That was like T-ball. I kind of set that one up it for you. It does go by fast. Um, now, I want to show this clip that I think is, we have two choices. The opening thing with you and Shanling is crazy, ridiculously funny, and proves that you're quite the sketch player. Um, or, we do, or we show a couple of minutes of the actual stand-up itself. Which would you rather show? Let's do the opening. Right? Yeah. Have a little fun, yeah. for fuck's sake. All right, let's show the opening with Shanling. And then, if we may, I'd like to segue right into the Larry King game so that Kevin can have a chance to see it. Nice. Because I force all my guests to do this, and the pressure is on. Not that you'll be fired. Again, no pressure here like there was the Saturday Night Live. You won't be There's fired. no pressure. No. There's no pressure. But I would like you to see the premise of the game. I would love to see it. I've heard a lot about it. Okay, good. Then let's show the opening <laughs> of Kevin's stand-up special, <laughs> um, which uh, is uh, it's dropping as a DVD any moment now, or did it already happen? Are you dropping like a baby? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be released October 6th. October 6th? Yes. That would be Tuesday, which you're not available because you have your own show at The Laugh Factory. 
That's right. I'm hosting okay. a show there every Tuesday. New material only. New material only. I do new material, and then I bring up about you know, six or seven comics. They do about seven minutes, and then I interview them afterwards very quickly, much like you're doing right now. Is that right? Yeah. All right. Well, then after I do my thing at the Coronet the following Tuesday, if you'd like, I'll stop by. That would be awesome. I'm offering. I would love I'm that. I'm not insisting. I would love that. Okay. I would absolutely love it. <laughs> okay. Who am I doing? Who's that? I would love it. It's nobody. <laughs> it's nobody. And I do them quite well. <laughs> All right. Show the, uh, we're going to take intermission now, and you're going to see the Gary Shandling and Kevin, the opening, cold opening to his stand-up special, which uh, comes out on DVD October 6th. And then we're going to segue right into the Larry King game, and um, there might be some urinating on our part. But enjoy this. Hey. How you doing? Good. What's up? Nothing. Just gearing up for my special. Any chance of seeing you later on? I wouldn't count on it, pervert. Hang on a second. Excuse me, do you mind? I'm on the phone. Well, are you ready? Feeling good? You feel good about tonight? You should feel good. It's fantastic, man. Why aren't you talking to me? Are you being like uh, an asshole or what? Oh, I'm sorry, Gary. I thought you were on the phone. I didn't know you were talking to me. Oh, Kevin. Good to see you, buddy. I didn't see you there. I'm just uh, on the phone a second. I'm standing next to Kevin Nealon in the urinal next to me, not in the urinal, at the urinal. It'd be odd if he was in the urinal. You guys should come see this. This, this. this place spooks me. I said this, you're cutting it, no, you're going, you're going in and out. You're going, you're, Kevin, you're going in and out. Oh, jeez. See all over my shoes. Going all over, now what are you going to do? You going to wear those? He's a little tense before the show. He's ruined his shoes and I don't know. Just tense. Tense before the show. How's Showtime treating you? Good. Good? Then you go right to DVDs? Yeah, we'll go from Showtime Fantastic. to DVDs. Fantastic. It sounds good. I'm not, Kevin, I'm talking to Dave the company. I can't... I can't talk to you and talk to him and do this all at the same time, buddy. Five minutes. Great. Copy. Are you sure you want to go through with this? I'm really concerned about the material. Yeah, me too. Is it too late to back out? Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Nealon! I have all my guests do something called the Larry King game. You do a bad Larry King impression, okay. reveal something about yourself on the air as Larry, doing the show, and then go to the phones. Hopefully the name of the city is somewhat funny sounding. Okay, let me begin the transformation into Larry King. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Feel it? <laughs> Pretend like you're wearing an Ed Harder shirt yet? Yep. You just got divorced? You got, oh, you married a younger woman? Oh, third heart attack. Fourth heart attack. Fourth, there you go. Go, go, you're getting it. I have a birthmark in the shape of Satan on the tip of my penis. <laughs> Brown Town, Ohio, <laughs> you're on. <laughs> Back when I was still drinking, I used to dream I was being attacked by a giant raccoon and I'd wake up the next morning with a dead furry in bed beside me. Bald Knob, Arkansas, talk to me. Here we are, I'm Larry King, and whenever I go to bed each night, I sleep with a copy of Blue Crush between my ass cheeks. Why? so I can ensure that I'll have the kind of dreams I want. Dreams where Michelle Rodriguez kicks me around the goddamn studio and do, does what I call clipboarding my balls. Go! And just a side note, ever since my 82nd birthday, my poop looks like strawberry ice cream. Tastes like vanilla. Michigan Falls, Indiana, you're on the line. When I'm feeling a little lonely, I dress myself up as a battered nun and head down to the farmer's market. It's a great conversation starter. Mesquite, Nevada, go ahead. <laughs> Every time I say or hear Anderson Cooper's name, a little bit of pee trickles down my leg. Knoblick, Kentucky, are you there? Speaking of bedwetting, I can't tell when I'm peeing. 
<laughs> Braintree, Massachusetts, you're on the air. Before the surgery, I was known as Larry Queen. Sagaponic, New York, you're on the air. Our next guest is the woman I want to fuck, Dakota Fanning. Uh, uh, Boca Raton, yo, you're on the air. <laughs> <laughs> is that wrong? Is that <laughs> no more calls, we've got a winner. Larry King here. These suspenders are the only things holding up my balls. Coming, Georgia. You're on. The best piece of pussy I ever had was Mary Magdalene. Yukaipa, <laughs> California. You're on the air. <laughs> Hi, this is Larry King. Why? I'm so old what? that I am the Virgin Mary's illegitimate father. Christmas, Florida. You're on the air. One time. They'll be back. Was that it? There's your nice. little clip package. Nice. Um, I think we saw this on the... Uh, on the monitor there. This uh, is available in stores October 6th. That's right, on Amazon.com and also iTunes. All right. I'm not sure right. why you're yelling at me. Ah, oh, you don't need to <laughs> yell. Um, yeah, I saw the whole special. It really is fantastic. And you shot at a theater. Was it in San Diego? Where's the theater? No, it was in uh, North Hollywood, El Portal Theater. North Hollywood? Yeah, it used to be a regular movie theater. Then it was a porno theater. All right. And then it became a regular, you know, just a special events theater. Ah, nice. Yeah, not bad. And we shot that during the, uh, when the, all the fires were outside of L.A. And all the smoke, you know, permeated, like, everywhere. You know, you, right. you, the whole inside of the theater smelled like it was on fire. Do you think so that you, enhanced the show? Well, you'll see a lot of people leaving. They thought it was on fire. And that's the excuse you're offering? That's what I'm going with. Okay. Because <laughs> I don't buy it. Yeah, I don't I, buy I don't it think I don't think half the three people watching buy it either. A um, couple more things about the SNL, and then I'd like to hear more about the weeds. Because uh, nice. I love, 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 love the show. We both do. Um, no Hans and Franz movie. Was it close at one point? It was close. Yeah. We wrote a, uh, we wrote a Hans and Franz movie. We wrote, Dana and I wrote it with uh, Conan O'Brien and Robert Smigel. It was called Hans and Franz, The Girly Men Dilemma. The Girly Men Dilemma. The Girly Men Dilemma, and it was a musical. <laughs> How and, is uh, this not made? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, we had a deal with Sony. And, right. you know, they paid for us to write it, and Arnold Schwarzenegger was co-producing it and was going to co-star in it. And then I think, um, I think... Last Action Last Hero? Last Action Hero came out, and he got cold feet about, you know, parroting himself. And so it just went uh, on a shelf and sat there. And where it sits to this day. It is, it is. But occasionally I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up and I'll read it again, and I'll think, this is funny. This it's got to be funny. funny. Yeah. I would like to do a stage reading of it. Is that possible? That is very possible. <laughs> okay. Tarzan, Frankenstein, and Tonto. Yeah. The origin and how fucking ridiculous. Fun. That was written by Jim Downey, who was, um, a, you know, writer on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Was he ever head writer? Because he was. Yeah, he was, he was like the elder statesman. Yeah, he was from Harvard. Right. And uh, so he came up with that, and uh, and it was just very dry, and uh, you know, uh, Phil Hartman played um, Frankenstein. And uh, Lovitz played uh, Tarzan, and I played uh, no, I, I played Tarzan. Lovitz played Tonto. Right. And it was just silly. And there were no uh, lyrics, as I recall. It was the, you know it was every each character doing their um, Moon. rendition of uh, whatever the song was, or you know. Yeah, it was. It had a holiday theme. It did. It did. And Tarzan seemed like a, the one you played. Seemed, he just seemed like he might have been an adult, just a little bit of an idiot. They were all idiots. <laughs> but I don't often think of Tano as being an idiot, but as portrayed by Lovitz, he was an idiot. Yeah, he was. Have you had Lovitz on here? No. Okay. We actually have a standing rule. You do? Yeah. He can't be on. And if he is, he's got to stand. Yeah. Yes. No, he'll be on. Um, actually, when I, I know sometimes you know when you're on location shooting a movie in Toronto or wherever, you have, you, they tell you to leave a different name at the front desk. Yeah. Or if you're in town and all the radio stations say, so what hotel you stay? Yeah, yeah. You know? I always stay under the name John Lovitz. That way no one will bother me. Oh, wow. <laughs> See what I did? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Jealous? <laughs> Jealous? Zip? Wee? Yeah. No, I, I, uh, John's my favorite nine-year-old. I love him to death. <laughs> I really do. I, I love everything about him. And I would love to have him on the show. John, if you're watching, or when you watch... Uh, open invitation. Um, talk to me about the uh, how weeds came to be, how it became a part of your life. Because, like I said, we're devoted fans. You just finished the fourth. 
Uh, fifth season. Fifth season. I got a call from Dana Carvey. It was at Lauren's house. <laughs> You're not going to believe this. <laughs> I've got a script here. It says this is not the rehearsed, car. by the way, honestly. The man, this is all off the top. Um, so he's in Paul Simon's closet and he calls you. <laughs> no, I was, you know, I was just, um, you know, reading scripts, looking for, um, you know, a gig on TV, and this one fell in my hands. It weeds, and I thought at first, I thought, ah, I don't want to do like a stoner kind of a show, you know. And I read it. And I thought, wow, this is really good. Yeah. You know, it's it's well written. I like the characters, and um, so I went in. I'm, you know, I went in. I auditioned for it. You know, I'm sitting in the waiting room with everybody else. You know, and um, really, and this after you know, like nine seasons on Saturday Night Live and two failed sitcoms. You right. Know? And uh, you know, the agents always tell you that's what they do now. You got to go and you got to audition. There's no like, you know. I said okay. I hear it all the time. So I said, you know, I, I called in and I read it, and it feels right. They're liking it, and then they offer me a. a part. I forgot about it. You know how they you do a thing, and then. Uh, and then they call and um, they said they would like you to do the guest star on the pilot. You know, it's just the guest star part, and uh, we shot that. And again, you know, you forget about it. You never think a pilot's going to get picked up. Right. And then I got a call like a month or two later saying, "Hey, that remember that thing you read for? It got picked up the guest star thing, and they want you to be a regular on there." Doug. Doug Wilson. Yeah. yeah. So I said, "Great, let's do it." And I remember shooting the pilot. We did it in Valencia, and it was about 110 degrees. Easily. And um, and the first scene I was in was inside of a, a SUV. And you can't run the air conditioning you know, when you're shooting. Because of the sound yeah. department. I thought you looked a little sweaty in that scene. Oh, it was so hot. And then I'm inhaling this uh, honey rose herb, you know, that was supposed to be the pot. And, and I, I had to smoke so much of that, you know. And, and then that night I woke up in the middle of the night. My throat was on fire. I'm thinking, what am I doing? I've got throat <laughs> cancer for some silly pilot. <laughs> yeah. You know. And, and five uh, seasons later. Five seasons later and, you know, 3,000 tokes later. <laughs> right. You know, and what is it you're smoking on the show? It's honey rose herb. What does that mean? That means that it's legal. <laughs> <laughs> it's from Colombia. As far as I know, yeah, it's legal. No, it's uh, it's an herb. You know, it's just like uh, don't they have those cigarettes you roll like made out of clover or something? Yeah, but the clove. That's why I was asking because the clove is that's just death. I think. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, but so you're not smoking the clove. No, it's honey rose herb, and it's rolled, you know, in rolling paper. We do in a pipe. But I'm telling you, I'm not a smoker, so inhaling anything sure. makes you lightheaded. Yeah. And uh, same with Justin. We we couldn't get off the couch one time. We were just really so lightheaded from it. You know, because you do a lot of takes, and yeah, you know, and, and then your close-ups, and you know. So uh, I try to avoid it as much as possible now. What the close-ups? You know? Yeah. <laughs> the honey rose HR. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of uh, Justin Kirk, your co-star, hermaphrodite. Probably okay. We had a we had a bet going. <laughs> the ladies like Justin. Oh boy, do he's they? a ladies man. Yeah, yeah. He's a ladies man. Yeah. He he uh, he seems to have no problem. No sequestering women. He does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how are the hours on the single camera half hour? Because unlike the sitcom, which is maybe the easiest job in show business, yeah. The single camera half hour, you have less time than the single camera one hours who complain constantly I love those actors yeah. you see well we're doing 17 18 hour days all right then you know what get out of the business because yeah you're lucky to have no, nobody should be complaining yeah uh, for me it's very easy I shoot maybe one or two days a week dream job dream job I sit in the trailer I wait for them to call me right. I bring my laptop I'm doing other stuff you know sure even if it's just pounding like that yeah sometimes I don't bring the laptop and I just do this <laughs> right. and you know what the internet is so great <laughs> I've been able to send out stuff just playing on the table yeah. if you have wireless table it's amazing <laughs> you can Google I did hear that eventually that's what the laptops are gonna be it'll be like a little pole with mm -hmm. a light kind of a beam thing it'll show the keyboard on a flat surface and you just hit those Things. That makes sense. It doesn't make sense. But that's what it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make sense at all. That's what I heard. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, yeah. So I go in and I do. Um, you know, some weeks it's it's more than others. Sometimes you're doing night shoots and it's it's a while. You know, but typically it's a, a very easy schedule. And we do 13 weeks. It's only 13 season. shows. Yeah, we have like a nine month hiatus. It's fantastic. But it's uh it's unfortunate that it's that long of a hiatus because people love the show so much they wanted to come back. And, have, and I keep saying, well, you know, it takes a long time to grow that stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. You need a new product. Yeah, you need a new product coming in. Nancy Butwin. I'm working Nancy on him. Nancy Butwin. I'm working on him. On, on uh, Esteban. <laughs> Nancy Butwin. Nancy Butwin. Yeah, I, I spend, uh, we love the show, I'll, uh, I, you know, I'm like Zelig. I'll, I'll continue talking like him for the next six <laughs> hours when each episode ends. Showtime's doing very well. You know, they got, um, 
Dexter, Dexter yeah. you know, the United States of Terror, yeah. Californication. They're right. really like kind of just pushing HBO kind of aside. Yeah, well, for, kind of forever they were the also ran. Yeah. But within the last six years, I would say, they become, we can, we can, you know, fight with anybody in the ring now. And they can compete. They were the underdogs. See? Maybe that's why you rooted for them. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly why I rooted Under, for them. Underdog. But who would have known that Weeds would have gone five seasons? You know, I certainly didn't. Again, another bet that I lost. Oh, did you bet that it would fail? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, talk to me about this. That's one. a book. Yes. It looks <laughs> like you on the cover. That is me on the cover. And um, that was a book that I wrote because You on the I, back as well. I bet that's not actually your child. No, that's a stunt child. Right. That's what yeah. I was hoping. Yeah. Yes, you're pregnant, but what about me? That's available in bookstores everywhere. The and paperback edition is out now. And on Amazon, I'll bet. Also. And on Amazon.com. Amazon's your friend. They are my friend. My ride's here. Oh, I got to go. Um, actually, you have to go. So that book is about um, kind of like, you know, there's not a lot of books about men going through a pregnancy. And you felt it was about time. I think it was about time. and Because, um, you know, there's no, there's no love at all, no empathy for the man. The guy goes through a lot, too. You know, granted, the woman goes through more, and it's painful and all that, but what about the guy? For example? You know? For example, how do you deal with hormonal, you know, uh, upheaval? Oh, you know, how do you deal with that? In your wife, you mean? In the wife, yeah. yeah. How do you deal with the ga weight gain? I gained 30 pounds when did I you? got pregnant. I did, yeah. I was eating a lot of stuff. Uh, and how do you deal with, you know, preparing to go into a delivery room? You know, I wanted to be in the room during the conception. Did you? I, you know, a lot of guys don't like that, but I don't mind. It's it. overrated. I got, I got through it. <laughs> but the delivery was something else. You know, I, I would, was not a fan of that. And plus, I'm an older dad, too. So um, this book is also talks about kind of, you know, just the pregnancy thing is kind of a starting point. It kind of like it gives me an opportunity to go sure. back and kind of, it's more of a memoir, actually, of my life. You yeah, know? I thought it was, too. When you're about to have a child, you start thinking about your own childhood and your parents and, right. and your whole upbringing. And it, uh, it's a good, good way to reflect. And it's very cathartic to be able to write that. In. I thought the passage about you as an uh, adolescent and you're running with Roman Polanski was rather telling. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we went our separate ways. Clearly. Yeah. Um, That's when I hooked up with Mackenzie Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> do you like the Twitter? I noticed you uh, had a very funny tweet about... Uh, I do like, uh, I like Twittering. I don't do it as much as I... The last couple of weeks I've kind of fallen off a little bit. I've been very busy. What but, the hell? But I haven't abandoned it. Okay, good. I like the Twitter. Because, you know, you got followers. I have great followers. Like you you have know, they're very supportive. I, w I was surprised at how supportive they are. They, you know, they're behind you 100%. They love the special. They love weeds. It's like you're, they're your family. No, no. I think it's great. No, they're not, though. They're not. No. No. <laughs> no. But, but there's a, there's, what I don't like is when they're so, um, they correct you, like if you misspell something. Oh, the correcting of the spelling makes yeah. me crazy. <laughs> or if you show a picture, you know, and they'll find the littlest things. What were your finger doing over there? You know, what is your finger? Uh, yeah. Seems like you're grabbing her kind of hard right there. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. They must like, ex you know, enlarge it and yeah. like with a magnifying glass. I love no matter what you write, you're going to get comments on, on all sides of it. You know, you're going to get people saying, I couldn't agree with you more. And then right <laughs> yeah. next to it is, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> yeah. And people um, sometimes don't realize that you're kidding around. Yeah. They think you're serious. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and for me, I'm always kidding around. Please. Yeah, I'm always being um, sarcastic. We get live questions from the Twitter universe, and we nice. have one for you now. Bring it. If you dare. Bring it. Uh, and also throw up a tweet five when you get a chance there, will you? Uh, What'd you say, throw up a tweet five? <laughs> 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 I did say. When does that DVD drop? Throw I up did. a tweet five. <laughs> 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 um, this is from Elaine Ewing, at Elaine Ewing, one of our regulars. She's threatening to come to your show on Tuesday. Threatening to come to show. my show. Well, we'll talk about that later. She's promised to come to my show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was rumored, she says, or asks, that early episodes of Weeds were leaked online intentionally. Is that true, or will you, were you the culprit? Did you hear anything about this, early episodes? She, I wonder if she means the first season. Uh, did you ever hear I, early episodes? I don't know anything about that, although I was responsible for it. Oh, well, then that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because that way you can't deny it. And no, I don't. I don't know anything about that. You won't confirm it. But I wish I did. If I did know, I would um, say so. Yeah, I think it's tantalizing. I, think I love the whole leak thing. Yeah. You know, people leak things to yeah. get it out there, and it's supposed to help. And, right. 
you know. I like the early leak. In fact, this show, this whole series. How many times do you get up to leak at night? <laughs> <laughs> seriously, how many times? As a man of our age? Yeah. 17, is that a well, lot? Well, seriously. Is that a lot? Five times for me. <laughs> is that an average? I told my doctor, because they always ask you when you go to physical, are you urinating a lot at night? I said, yeah, I'm like five times a night. <laughs> he goes, seriously? I said, yeah. He goes, interesting. And he never does anything about it. <laughs> and I realized That's that uh, interesting. I would have a better night's sleep if I started on the toilet and then got up to go to my bed five times a night. <laughs> I, I swear, I think that would, uh, that would be more much better night's sleep for me. Do you, have you done the uh, camera up the tush yet? Cause I, I've I, done that several times, <laughs> but not on a professional basis. <laughs> several times. <laughs> I'm having it once a week. <laughs> I have no problem with it. I'm, I'm so enamored with me and, and my my work that I like the camera in all orifices. Yeah. Um, well, I'm I'm thrilled for your health and well-being, and I think the peeing a lot at night is okay, uh, as long as your doctor continues to think that it's okay. <laughs> that is amazing, though, because you're I right. I don't know why the, um, you know, that's a lot. Maybe if I peed on his rug five times, he'd do something about it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> he probably would. <laughs> Um, I know somebody that keeps like a little milk carton next to the bed so he doesn't get up to go. He just kind of rolls over and pees in the milk carton and puts it back down. Really? Yeah. Because Chandler back looked back. very healthy in that clip. He did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's you, not who I'm talking no, about. No, of course not. Um, uh, I, I want you to start to focus on your version of the Larry King game because I would like to get you out of here on time. You okay. Have, you have a drive ahead of you. You have plans. You have a family. You have a young child coming up on three years old, right? Yeah. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, the brood is growing and everyone's happy and healthy. It's pretty nice, right? <laughs> <laughs> God, that is great. I'm, I'm very, uh, nothing else is as important. Well, you're pretty important, but not as important <laughs> as the brood. <laughs> right. You can't beat the brood. No. Um, now, to stall further for your Larry King game, Bad Larry King impression, reveal something. So what are we doing? Doing uh, Bad Larry King, something, reveal something about him, right? and, and then take a town. And then go to the phone, and if the town is funny sounding, it's fantastic. Oh, funny sounding town. It doesn't have to be. Uh, I mean, Pacoima, by the way, is funny sounding, so don't put too much pressure on it. Okay. Uh, from the chat room, uh, he's also on Twitter, at New York Actor, at, at NY Actor. Tweet 5. The tweet five that I asked for, these are rapid-fire questions. It's a yes or a no. It's a this okay. or a that. Bring it. It's a peanut butter or a chocolate. He uh, uh, has fave line of yours from Sandler film, and he wrote in parentheses, Bull Dance. Why do I not know this movie, Bull Dance? Happy Gilmore. Uh, doing the Bull Dance. Doing the Bull Dance. Yeah. I thought he meant the name of the movie was Bull Dance. Threw me right off. No, that sounds like a Kevin Costner film. <laughs> Bull Dance. Wait a second. Didn't he do Bull Dance? <laughs> he may not have. Dances with dance. Dances bulls. with the wolves. <laughs> Dances with bulls. Dances with wolves. Um, do you have a fave line of yours? That's always a strange thing for an actor to conjure up. Uh, I don't really have a, a favorite line. In fact, I I can't remember the names of the characters I play in a lot of films that I do. But I think maybe um, people like the the line "Feel the flow." Feel the flow from Happy Gilmore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel the, the flow. That's got to be your favorite. You'll enjoy this next question, number two of the tweet five. Tits or ass? Tits. All right. <laughs> Are you talking guys or girls? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Okay. It's whatever comes to mind. Um, strangest weeds on set moment, other than your throat being on fire. Is there a strangest? Strangest weeds on set moment. Uh, you heard some great moments. You know, you talking with Albert Brooks about his life and career, but there must have been some uncomfortable oddities. Oh, man, you know what? You might have described it with the, with the grimacing with the penis in the drawer. That yes. might have been it. Yeah, that was Let's it. Let's go with that. No, I think, you know, probably the strangest one was the... Um, the end of the fourth season with the autoerotic asphyxiation. Yes. To have to stand up on a chair, naked like that, uh -huh. except for a shirt and a rope around you, and do the the whole thing. Uh -huh. well, that was kind of weird. Right. <laughs> I mean, to do it in front of people. Right. <laughs> for a change. I've never actually tried that in real life. You right. Know? But it, if you it just seems dangerous. But I'll tell you what: if somebody broke into my house and they were strangling me anyway, I might give it a shot, just because it was convenient. You know, I thought it was you who, I, you might have tweeted that. No, no, it was in your stand-up special, I think. It made me laugh really hard. I think I tweeted hard. that. I think you tweeted it. If you thought you were going to, you were being strangled, you might try to squeeze one off just to see. <laughs> it would be the one time where it would make sense. <laughs> well, I'm being strangled. And you, it would be so creepy, the guy would probably let you go, whoa, <laughs> what are you doing? You can't be enjoying this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, number four, tofu or hummus? Hummus. Sure. And then lastly, fave, he likes the fave, 
Carvey bit? Um, I would say the, um, the the favorite Carvey bit for me is the uh, Hedwood Harry. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. My mine might be uh, Larry. Can I finish? Uh, Perot was good yeah. too. I also like the um, the, uh, the the heterosexual gay man. Yes, it was very good. Yeah, because we all know that guy. Yeah, everybody knows a guy like that. Um, I was saying also the uh, Larry kind of finish as a way to segue into your Larry King game. Wait, right. one more tweet five, and then oh yeah, we got to get you out of here. But this is from our from one of our really main uh, regulars as well, Martha underscore S. She's oh, on yes. the Twitter yes. at Martha underscore S. Tweet five: Space travel or time travel, Kev? Time travel, right? Yeah, you want to you want to be yeah. the first one to shoot Lincoln in the head. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> David Bowie or David Wilcox? David Wilcox. See, it's not yeah. so easy. Uh, Tofurky or Boca Burger? What's a Boca Burger? Boca Burger is a veggie burger. All right, it's very good. Actually, so it's my tofurky favorite veggie or burger. Boca? Um, I think generally Boca Burger. Yeah, right. Yeah, because it's got. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm an expert. <laughs> yeah. Um, be gossiped about or never discussed. These are not easy. This is a difficult one. Yes, it is. I would say um, never discussed. Because <laughs> they both suck. Yeah. Um, and your celebrity man crush? No, it can't be anyone in this room. Mine's Bobby Flay, just so you know. Bobby Flay? I'm taking the pressure off you. Um, celebrity man crush? Wow. Used to be Harrison Ford. Used to be? Yeah. But then he hooked up with uh, <laughs> Ally McBeal. <laughs> <laughs> so when you no longer have a chance? I think maybe Craig Daniels. Let's say Craig Daniels. Is that the guy, the James Bond guy? To block. J James Bond? Craig Daniels to block. Yeah. That makes sense. That, yeah. yeah. Daniel Craig, that's right. No, no, it's Craig Daniel. Well, you know, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to Craig Jenny to lose some weight. <laughs> so I always kind of mix things up a little bit. Well, you can say Craig comma. By the yeah, Craig, comma Daniel. By the way, that's what happens at our age. We we pee five times and we then we mix. The, yeah. I introduced my dad to uh, George Lucas on the on the set of Willow, and he said, "I really love ET." So we've all <laughs> <laughs> at some point we become our fathers. Um, all right, that is your camera. That's the barrel you'll be staring down. If you'd like to get out of here at the predetermined time, it's time for the Larry King game. See who play. When, All right, sir. When you're All ready. All right, sir. And again, there's no prize and there's no record to be broken. All right, let me get the body going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, everybody, and we're back uh, with Kevin Pollock. <laughs> little known fact about myself, I like to, um, when I have acid reflux, I put it in a little cup. And I keep it by my bed, and I give it to my wife at night. She likes it. It puts us both to sleep. Lake Winnipesaukee, New Hampshire, your call. <laughs> yes, we have a winner. Love it. Lake Winnipesaukee, come on. That's the Doesn't capper. Get any better than that. No, 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 you can't touch that. Intercourse, Pennsylvania. <laughs> that actually exists as well. We've had that. We get that almost every week, by yeah. the way, the Intercourse, Pennsylvania, so I'm glad you went with the other one. Lake um, Winnipesaukee. I, I can't thank you enough. i got to drive you home now. You've got a place to be. Yeah, uh, but we, we, we just scratched the surface. We only scratched it. So I think you'll come back. I will come back. Eventually. Once you've run through everybody else. <laughs> yes. And you start doing others. <laughs> right. Who would you like to have on here that you know you'll never get? Uh, God, that list is endless. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You, do want, you want the first go-to? I mean, to? somebody, like, reasonable that you would like to have on. Um, I'm not talking like Barack Obama. Warren Beatty. Warren Beatty? Yeah. Let you can make that happen. Do. Let me see what I can do. Actually, you're one degree of separation. I mean, I, I've met Warren on uh, several occasions. I find him absolutely fascinating. But, uh, you know, without the digits, it's difficult to reach out to the man. But he's very close with Shandling. Interesting. It's not important. Just saying. I can get to him. All right. Through his kids. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's always the easiest way. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Don't move. I'm going to just wrap up here, and, uh, and then we'll drive you home. Nice. Uh, my guest, Kevin Nealon, you, uh, you have all these opportunities to get yourself some lovely items. He has a color theme. Do you see what it is? I do. Uh, and I his yeah. special uh, comes out on DVD through the Amazon <laughs> on October 6th. 
And uh, that also happens to be the night that you can come see me at the Largo. And if you can't make it, by all means, go see Kevin at the uh, you know, one Laugh thing Factory. We did not discuss, Kevin, Let's do that and now. I, hate to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I have a show on Nick at Night called Glenn Martin DDS with Catherine O'Hara. Wait a second. I read about this and yeah. somebody. I was missing forward. I was told that the show was no longer. Uh, oh, no. I beg to differ. <laughs> do you? Yeah. Is this uh, it's a, on every Monday night at it, 8 o'clock, Nick at Night. It's kind of like a, the same kind of a tone as like The Family Guy or The Simpsons, only it's stop action. It's like, it looks like claymation. Right. And I play Glenn Martin DDS, and Catherine O'Hara plays my wife. And the family travels around. In a, in a Winnebago. Right. Yeah. It's still going? When, it when just is started. It, <laughs> <laughs> it just started. Yeah. When does it, when, when, when can Monday we Monday nights uh, at 8 o'clock. Is it Nick on at night? night? Yeah. It's on tomorrow night, 8 o'clock. Okay. That's it. That's it. That's it, man. That's all we needed to know. Eight o'clocks, eight o'clocks, Mondays, <laughs> nights. It's going to be huge. 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 Uh, there you have it. There and it the is. The name of it is Doc Martin. Glenn Martin. <laughs> DDS, two ends. Look, oh, come on, I got to get out <laughs> we're of like here. A, we're, between us, we're 107 also. I, I don't know where the here. fuck I get off making fun of Larry King. Uh, more dinosaurs when we come back. No. Uh, so, we'll see you next week. Let's go out and see what the crew is up to before we sign off. Wait, that seems weird. They left us a note. All right. God bless you and each and every one of you. And to my Jews, uh, I atone for my sins every day. I don't need the annual wrap-up. Uh, I will see you next week with the uh, uh, beautiful and, and wildly gifted uh, singer-songwriter, uh, Lisa Loeb. I'm very excited about you that. Say I only hear what I want to. Don't matter anyway, anyhow, anyway, anytime. Until then, as always, you say, get out of my face. <laughs>